Okay, it's 5.30 sharp, so let's begin. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our deep webinar on India-Sri Lanka relations. Uh, my name is Anirudh Kanisati. I'm Associate Fellow here at Takshashila, um, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, let me briefly introduce you to the concept of this webinar and what we're probably hoping to achieve. Um, one way to think about the history of the subcontinent um, is that it's made up of a lot of geopolitical regions who all have their kind of unique trajectory throughout history. Um, think of the Deccan, you think of uh, the plains of Tamil Nadu, the Gangetic Plains, the Indus Valley. Um, all of them kind of have their own unique histories leading into the colonial period, um, after which you see the formation of a number of new uh, nation states or this massive landmass. Um, and all of these nation states have had um, quite contested and tempestuous uh, and really complicated relationships um, in the last century or so. Uh, and perhaps none, uh, no relationship is as important um, as the India-Sri Lanka dynamic, um, which goes back at least 2,300 years. Um, so over the course of this webinar, um, we'll be speaking to a number of experts to get a Sri Lankan perspective um, on the relationship between these two powers. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy, uh, the former director of Sri Lanka's Central Bank. Um, I'm hoping to learn a lot from you, sir, about um, the economic relationship between India and China. Um, Professor Rohan Gunaratne from uh, Nanyang Technical University in uh, Singapore is here. Uh, thank you for joining us, sir. Um, Professor Gunaratne is going to be talking about uh, the security relationship and broadly how um, Sri Lanka sees itself, especially in the uh, relationship between um, India and China. Um, we also have with us uh, Dr. Mile from um, Nias, Bangalore, um, and Dr. Samatha Malampati from um, ICW in New Delhi. Um, so we have quite an interesting uh, panel of discussions today. We're hoping to have um, really get into the details of the India-Sri Lanka dynamic. Um, and I really invite all of our participants, uh, please use the Q&A panel extensively. Um, we'd be happy to unmute you uh, and actually hear what you think and have a one-on-one -on -one between you and our uh, panelists later on in the conversation. Um, so before I begin, though, uh, I'd just like to uh, say a few words about uh, the folks who have brought us together. Um, I work with the Takshila Institution, uh, as you all might know. Takshashila is an independent center for research and education and public policy. Uh, we're an independent and nonpartisan think tank, uh, and we're concerned with how India shapes the world and also how the world shapes India. We're focused on transforming how India is governed and exploring the intersection between technology, economics, and geopolitics. Uh, our partners today are the Pathfinder Institute, uh, the Pathfinder Foundation, uh, who are an independent, nonpartisan research and advocacy think tank that promotes market-oriented economic reforms and public-private partnerships aimed at contributing towards effective social and economic development. Um, in the pursuit of these objectives, uh, Pathfinder does relation building with Track 1.5 and Track 2 institutions in the region. Um, it has also developed partnerships with Bangladesh, China, India, Iran, Israel, Japan, Nepal, Norway, Singapore, the Russian Federation, and the USA. Um, a special thanks to Mr. Pratap Hevlikar for bringing us all together. Hope to hear from you towards uh, the ending of this discussion, sir. Um, so without any further ado, let's actually get started um, and let's get the, the conversation started. Um, over to you, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the India-Sri Lanka economic relationship? Uh, thank you very much, Anirudh. Um, let me uh, thank both the Takshila Institute and the Pathfinder Foundation for uh, giving me this opportunity to participate uh, in this webinar. Uh, and again, it's nice to see some of my colleagues from the Pathfinder Foundation and to uh, come across new uh, friends from Takshila and also to see uh, my old friend and renowned scholar, Professor Gunaratna. Um, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the way ahead as far as uh, Sri Lanka economic relations are concerned. Now, Sri Lanka-India relations, as Anirudh implied, uh, span many millennia. And they are multifaceted. If you look at the 2015 to 29 period, the most recent period, India was Sri Lanka's largest trading partner. It was the third most significant source of foreign direct investment. And it was the largest source of tourism. So it is a multifaceted relationship. In addition, uh, India has also been a source of concessional assistance as well as, as grants. The uh, Exim Bank of India has provided about USD 1.8 billion by way of credit lines, mainly for railway development. And the grant assistance has gone towards rehabilitation and resettlement in the conflict affected areas. And most recently, grant assistance was provided to set up an 
all island ambulance service, which is being greatly appreciated by the people of Sri Lanka. And I think as recently as last week, when the two prime ministers spoke, I think 15 million US dollars was made available by Prime Minister Modi for developing Buddhist links. So these are, uh, it's a very multifaceted relationship, the sound foundation to build on. Now, before going to the way ahead, what I'd like to do is to, to do three things. One is to establish certain principles which should underpin economic and trade relations between two very asymmetric economies. Secondly, I would also like to, to identify a number of tailwinds which are propitious, which are favorable for building on this good foundation that we have to further the economic and trade relations between our two countries. And then to make a very brief assessment of the Indo-Sri Lanka free trade agreement, and then try and identify certain priorities for the way ahead. So that's the structure of my remarks. So what are, what are the principles that should underlie uh, relations between two very asymmetric economies? Now, from the perspective of the much smaller country, it is much better, better to structure the bilateral relationship on rules-based frameworks, because ad hoc transaction, uh, transactional uh, relations tend to weigh against a smaller country. A smaller country does not have the leverage, uh, the countervailing power to, on a case-by-case -case basis, to pursue its interests. So if one can negotiate a rules-based framework, which is mutually beneficial, then I think that is a much better framework for um, structuring bilateral relations between two asymmetric economies. But however, for these frameworks to be mutually beneficial, two principles have to be accommodated. One is non-reciprocity, and two is special and differential treatment. And it is encouraging that India recognize these principles in the Indo-Sri Lanka free trade agreement. Because if you look at the positive list, the negative list, the transition periods to achieve the, the, um, the liberalization that is built into the agreement, there was a symmetry and there was uh, you know, special and differential treatment. So that reflected the fact that India accepted these principles. And going forward, these principles need to underlie um, the relations between these two very asymmetric economics economies. Now, let me um, now try and identify uh, some of these tailwinds that I was speaking about, uh, which are favorable in terms of trying to develop further the uh, bilateral uh, economic and trade relations. So one is India's neighborhood first policy. Now we have seen progress on the ground, particularly in the Northeast. The BBIN countries have made significant progress on power generation, on grid connectivity, on water transit, land transit, rail transit, water management, so a number of areas where we have seen significant progress in the North. And in the South, uh, India has strengthened its relations with the Maldivian government since the recent uh, election there. And Sri Lanka has, of course, we've had a very strong relationship between our two countries, as I indicated at the beginning. But more recently, we have seen India coming, being the first to assist in terms of response to the pandemic, uh, including medical supplies. The RBI has provided a SARC swap arrangement for 400 million, a further swap of a billion, and bilateral debt relief is being negotiated. Uh, so, you know, that you can see India's a neighborhood first policy beginning to gain traction on the ground. Now, of course, it is in India's strategic interest to have stability and prosperity on its southern border. Given the sensitivities in the northern border, in, a lot of India's strategic assets are in the south. And clearly, India would want a stable Sri Lanka. Uh, and so th there is an uh, um, enlightened self-interest for India to promote stability and prosperity in Sri Lanka. And equally for Sri Lanka, having an enormous market at, it, at its doorstep and what was the fastest growing large economy, I know that's been interrupted for a number of reasons, but there's no reason why after the pandemic, after we all of us get through this pandemic, um, that India cannot resume its uh, accelerated trajectory uh, of growth. And, India, and Sri Lanka, I, I will argue, is well placed to develop, uh, to benefit from that. Uh, the sec in fact, you know, um, in terms of uh, 
uh, Sri Lanka being important to India's strategic interests. I think it was Shiv Shankar Menon in his book wrote that Sri Lanka is like an unsinkable aircraft carrier parked 20 miles off the coast of India. So, you know, but what he was trying to say, I mean, in fact, I, I asked him about what, what, he, what he meant by this, and he explained that he was trying to explain Sri Lanka's strategic interest. In India. That's what that particular uh, phraseology um, uh, seeks to convey. So Sri Lanka is important for India, and India uh, is a great opportunity for Sri Lanka. Now, the second tailwind is the Make in India strategy and the reconfiguration of global supply chains that is being accelerated. Okay, so what is, uh, uh, you know, if, if India is making India a strategy gains traction, it would be possible to replicate what happened in East and Southeast Asia. When the economies of first Japan and then China um, took off, the countries in those sub-regions were able to plug into the supply chains of um, Japanese and Chinese companies. And, you know, I think the, uh, the term is the wild geese uh, formation. You saw them all move forward. So if the Make in India strategy gains momentum, there will be opportunities for Sri Lankan companies to plug into the supply chains of Indian companies. And now I think there was, uh, you know, reconfiguring of supply chains taking place even before the pandemic, partly because of the, the uh, fourth industrial revolution, we were beginning to see some reshoring. And also the increasing costs in southern China was also leading to some relocation of supply chains. But however, the pandemic has accelerated this process. And the opportunity exists for India to navigate between competing geostrategic imperatives by pulling the region closer to it economically through the promotion of regional value chains. And, 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 and this reconfiguring uh, um, will, I think, um, be of great benefit to India. India will have many opportunities because of this reconfiguring of uh, global supply chains. Uh, and equally, as I said, that should open up opportunities for Sri Lankan companies as well. As well. You know, pressures from uh, the global trade technology and geopolitical tensions are, you know, adding real momentum to this uh, um, supply chain kind of reconfiguring. Companies are reassessing and expediting planned diversification in their ultra-efficient single source and just-in-time supply chains on which the world economy had come to depend. That is changing. And India will definitely benefit from that. If Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is also well placed to, to, uh, to uh, uh, benefit because of its location uh, and some of the advantages it offers. But if Sri Lanka is agile and enterprising, we can also take advantage of some of the supply chain relocation to India as well. And, and one can foresee poss the possibilities for joint ventures between Sri Lankan and Indian companies to attract some of these supply chains because by having two locations, then the objective of diversification can also be fulfilled. Third tailwind relates to improved infrastructure. There has been proximity for millennia. However, poor infrastructure in both countries has met, led to very high transaction costs, which has meant that the the advantage of proximity was significantly uh, diluted. But now infrastructure in both countries, roads, um, ports, airports in both countries are improving. Uh, in addition, um, connectivity and logistics are improving. Um, all this means that proximity can now be a greater advantage. And this is something that, certainly from a Sri Lankan perspective, uh, that it's an opportunity uh, to, be, to be realized. Colombo port already uh, is very important a source of transshipment cargo for India. Uh, in fact, 82% of the transshipment cargo handled by uh, Colombo is Indian uh, uh, cargo. Uh, and even if, you know, if the, if the port in the Nicobar and Andaman Islands are, uh, is developed and Indian ports are developed, I think the growth trajectory of the Indian economy, if the potential is realized after the pandemic, there will be enough opportunities for the Sri Lankan port also to thrive and continue to thrive as a transshipment center for, for, for India. Um, the, also in terms of connectivity, Sri Lankan airlines before the pandemic had the highest number of arrivals in Indian destinations. So air connectivity was also uh, uh, good and, and uh, very good, I would say. So a fourth tailwind is the GST. I know the GST has had significant glitches, but once these glitches are uh, overcome, 
And if the original objective of one nation, one market, one, one, one tax, if that objective is fulfilled and there is a single market in India, that will also generate boost growth and boost trade and give opportunities for Sri Lankan companies uh, in terms of doing business in India. The fifth tailwind uh, uh, is, is the increase in people to people uh, contacts in both directions. Uh, so we had the, as I said, India is the number one source of tourism. Uh, there is Buddhist, uh, uh, the Buddhist, uh, the sacred Buddhist sites uh, in, in um, North India are very important uh, for Sri Lankan tourists. Uh, so uh, there is this connectivity between uh, through people to people contacts also increasing, as well as you know other forms of uh, people to people contacts through education, training, etc., which has been going on. And the final kind of uh, tailwind is the um, proximity to South India. You know, the five South Indian states have um, experienced high growth rates. The middle class is rising very quickly. And that, uh, the proximity to that region or that sub-region certainly creates opportunities. For Sri Lanka. So these are kind of the tailwinds uh, that are there uh, to be taken advantage of. Uh, let me now uh, quickly do an uh, assessment of the Indo-Sri Lanka FTA. You know, in, there is a general perception that it hasn't worked very well because as usual, people look at the overall balance of trade. And there, there is a very large deficit uh, in India's favor. Trade has increased from 623 million uh, in 2000 when the FTA was signed to 4.7 billion in 2019. And there is a trade deficit of 3.1 billion in favor of India. However, if you unpack that and look at trade uh, within the parameters of the free trade agreement, how much of trade has moved across borders on a preferential basis, then the picture is very different. Because Sri Lankan exports to India under the FTA amounted to 490 million. Uh, and uh, you know this was out of Sri Lanka's total exports to India of 763 million. So 64% of Sri Lanka's exports to India went across on a preferential basis. Going the other way, um, though uh, Indian, uh, import, uh, Indian exports to Sri Lanka amounted to US dollars 3.9 billion, the exports from India under a preferential basis amounted to only 199 million. So only 5% of India's exports to Sri Lanka came on a preferential basis. So if you look at the trade under the FTA, Sri Lanka actually enjoys a surplus of 299 million. Now, while this sounds good, it still means that there is considerable underutilized potential because there are a number of constraints, constraints, impediments, which Sri Lankan exporters have experienced in um, dealing with the Indian market. Uh, so the outcome could be a lot better. Uh, impediments such as non-tariff barriers, including sanitary and phyto phytosanitary standards, quotas on key Sri Lankan exports, customs clearance procedures, excess documentation charges, delays, all these have meant there is, there is a considerable unrealized potential. Now, we have now, let me now look at the future. And at the front and center of the future, from an economic perspective, is the economic and trade cooperation agreement, economic and technical cooperation agreement, that is being negotiated between the two countries. Uh, there have been 11 rounds of negotiations. The last was in September, 2018. Now high priority needs to be given to reviving these negotiations. However, it is important that as a confidence building measure, India tackles some of these impediments which have undermined the effectiveness of the ISLFTA. The ISLFTA had been beneficial for Sri Lanka, However, it could, be, could have been much more beneficial for Sri Lanka, but for these impediments. And progress has been made in these 11 rounds of negotiations in tackling some of these impediments, but they need now to be crystallized. And I think upfront, these should be addressed so that there is trust. Um, because there is a trust issue in this, you know, but any small country dealing with a much larger country, there is an inherent um, concern. Uh, and there are other historical issues as well. So in terms of trust, it is very advantageous if these impediments can be addressed up front and then the, the negotiations can, can continue. And the, the ETCA, in fact, not only deepens and widens the existing free trade agreement in goods, but it seeks to extend it to services, 
to technology, transfer to investment, and training. So it'll be a much wider uh, economic partnership agreement. And in all these areas, certainly Sri Lanka stands benefit. Now, um, in, a, in a discussion with uh, uh, Dr. Monte Kalualia, I remember him saying that he did not understand why Indian trade negotiations were not more flexible and generous. Because he said, even if Sri Lanka exported everything it produced in any item, it would not make a dent on the Indian market. Between 2000 and 2019, the period of the ISLFTA, Sri Lankan, sorry, Indian imports from Sri Lanka amounted to 0.2% of India's import. So even if uh, uh, Sri Lanka's exports to India increased tenfold, it would only be 2%. So really, um, I, I think uh, Dr. Alwalia made a very pertinent point. There is great um, scope of flexibility on India's side, because really, uh, of course, there are individual items, right? The pepper producers in southern India get very upset if, you know, if there isn't protection given to them, etc. So there'll be indi individual vested interests. But if you look at the big picture, really, there is considerable scope for India to be very flexible in terms of accommodating Sri Lanka's interests. And as we said, it is um, in Sri Lanka, in India's interest to have a stable and prosperous uh, so that its southern uh, flank is well secured. Um, then, if I may, next, uh, that, uh, a second area of uh, uh, that needs to be focused on going forward is is uh, the opportunity for Indian investment in the special economic zones that the government of Sri Lanka is now pushing forward. With. Uh, there is the port city development. Uh, there is a Hambantota free trade, uh, Hambantota special economic zone where there is going to be a pharmaceutical uh, uh, zone. Uh, there is another uh, zone in the northwest of the country in Bingiria, another in the southern uh, province in Melania. So there are a number of new um, special economic zones that are being opened up because the existing economic zones are full. So there are a number of new economic zones that are being opened up and there will be opportunities for Indian uh, uh, investment in areas such as pharmaceuticals, ICT BPM, automotive components, electronic and electrical goods. These have uh, be, the areas that have been identified as having having potential, and also in big infrastructure. You know, Sri Lanka is now pivoting from debt to equity for, for uh, big infrastructure, looking for equity investment, looking for PPPs, and one big investment is the East Container Terminal in the Colombo port. Another is an LNG plant where India is, has an interest, and hopefully these things can be moved forward. Uh, now, the... Um, other, another area that which has some, let me be very quick now, uh, just potential is, is, is grid connectivity. Now, there is technical feasibility to have grid connectivity between the two countries, and it would also help Sri Lanka in terms of load management. So, um, as well as in terms of facilitating the expansion of renewable energy based power generation, because having this load management means that you can have a higher proportion of renewable energy uh, and still have stability in the system. So. This is something that could be pursued. Uh, finally, um, uh, fisheries is an area of contention. I think this, uh, we need to minimize incursions. We need to institutionalize assistance for salvage operation of vessels. And we need to pay attention to ecological and conservation considerations. And the last meeting of the joint working group on fisheries was as far back as October, 2017. I think this needs revival and this issue needs to be resolved once and for all. Now, one very topical thing, Indian companies, particularly Serum, are now involved in massive manufacturing of COVID-related vaccines. I know uh, Serum has linked up with the Jenner uh, Center at Oxford and AstraZeneca, and it would be tremendously beneficial to Sri Lanka if some arrangement can be reached whereby Sri Lanka has access to uh, these vaccines uh, when they are available. Um, one last point. Uh, uh, because the Indo-Sri Lanka, Indo-China angle is going to be covered, and I know it will be covered um, extremely well by Professor Gunaratna, but let me say this. Um, Sri Lanka needs to be in a position to take advantage of the enormous amount of capital China is deploying around the world. We are very well situated geographically to take advantage of the maritime part of the BRR. And 
uh, as I said, Sri Lanka is now pivoting from, from, from debt to equity, and China is by far the largest source of capital, of equity uh, in the world. Uh, and Sri Lanka needs to be able to do that. But the government is very much on record that it will develop more and more commercial relations with China, but it will do so taking into account India's strategic interests. That is something His Excellency President Gotabe Rajapaksa has stated categorically. It has been repeated by the, on more than one occasion by the Foreign Secretary Admiral, uh, Professor Jainat Kolombage. They made it very clear, but this commercial relations with China can be of tremendous benefit to Sri Lanka and it needs to have the space to do that while taking care of India's strategic interests. So let me say uh, that uh, there's a promising foundation and also considerable scope to build on the bilateral economic and trade relations that currently exist. India needs to show flexibility and build trust. Sri Lanka needs to attach paramount importance to India's security interests and to demonstrate agility and enterprise to take advantage of the emerging opportunities in an extraordinarily large market at its doorstep. And what I believe will continue to be uh, one of the fastest growing large economies in the world. Thank you. I'm sorry I've gone over my time. No problem, Dr. Kumaraswamy. That's, um, that's a very eloquent summary of the India-Sri uh, India Lanka economic relationship that you've laid out for us. And there's quite a few things I'd like to get into uh, in a little while. Uh, but before we do that, uh, since you mentioned um, India-China relationships, I think it's a very elegant way to transition over to uh, Professor Gunaratne. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Takshila, and thank you, Pathfinder. Between India and Sri Lanka, we have a written history of 2,500 years. No country can replace the inherent relationship between India and Sri Lanka. We consider Indian subcontinent as family. We don't speak Chinese. We don't eat Chinese food. We don't dress like Chinese. And I want you to know that this relationship between India and Sri Lanka has its ups and downs. Because family members, they fight. Sometimes when they fight, you know, the relationships are strained for periods of time. But in reality, those relationships, they heal because ultimately family is family. I want you to know that. I also thought that I want to speak to you very openly and very frankly because for many years, when I was based in Sri Lanka, I covered India extensively, especially on the security and intelligence side. So I want to Uh, I, I Ashoka. Um, sorry, Professor, I, we missed the last couple of sentences because of the network connection. The, the relationship between India and Sri Lanka was cemented by Buddhism because the greatest gift Sri Lanka received was from Emperor Ashoka, Dharma Ashoka. He gave us Buddhism. And as you know, Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country. It's a Buddhist land. And we have, of course, invited members of other religious groups to come and build their presence, the Christians, the Muslims, the Hindus. But essentially, the foundation of Sri Lanka is Buddhism. It is Buddhism that has given the civilization that exists and that thrives in Sri Lanka. And I want to share with you that Emperor Asoka, both his daughter and his son, Teri Sangamitta and Arhat Mahinda, they have consolidated that relationship. And so I don't think that anyone can damage our cultural and religious relationship. But there were intermittent periods this relationship suffered. That is, if you look at the history of 
Sri Lanka, we have had 21 invasions, of which 17 invasions were from India, from the Chera, Chola, and the Pandyas. And of course, we had one invasion from the Chinese. They took our king, Veera Alakesar, to China. I have written a book about it, Sino Lankan Connection. I wrote that book 30 years ago. It was presented to the paramount leader of China. And I myself presented it to Li Xianyan. So if I go back to that relationship, we must not forget that our king, Veera Alakeswara, was taken by Chen He. And then, of course, we have the Dutch, the Portuguese, and the British that invaded us. So we have had good times, and we have had bad times. In recent memory, the bad time we had was 83 to 87. That is from 1983 to 87. India armed, trained, financed, and directed the Tamil Tigers. The first batch was trained in Uttar Pradesh, second batch in Himachal Pradesh. All the other batches, including the batch where Danu, the woman who killed Rajiv Gandhi, was trained in Tamil Nadu. So I want to share with you that sometimes India acted because India perceived that Sri Lanka was being used by foreign powers to destabilize India. Of course, at that time, Sri Lanka's best friend was the United States. And we had Israel also as our friends. But in 1990, all this changed in India. Indians didn't want the Americans and the Israelis. But after 1990, when I visited Delhi at cocktail parties, I would see Israelis and Americans as if they have been friends for a very long time. But Sri Lanka learned a very important lesson from that. That is, if India is angry with a country, is having poor relations with a country, we can't have good relations with that country. You see? Because India will destabilize us. So this time, President Gotabe Rajapaksa has very openly said that we will not allow the Chinese to have a military foot footprint. But every Indian must understand that our country suffered a 30-year war. And as a result of that, we have to develop our country, the economy of our country. Our social economic indices were much higher than India before the war. But now we hope to improve those indices and build relations with other countries. But President Gotabe Rajapaksa has clearly identified that Chinese are expanding in the Indian Ocean region. But he will not allow the Chinese to militarily threaten India using Sri Lanka. But at the same time, I want to share with you that the Chinese economic partnership with Sri Lanka will continue. Because if we do not build those economic ties and strengthen those economic ties, we cannot develop and progress throughout other countries. India must have a broad understanding of all these things. You see, And this, I hope, will come from the Indian think tanks and the academic community. If we take more time for the Indian foreign policy officers to understand this dimension. But they will also realize this sooner or later. Let me share with you another one more aspect. That is, President Rajapaksa has anticipated there will be very significant competition in the Indian Ocean region. And because of that, he has said very clearly that Sri Lanka is a neutral state meaning we will not take anyone's side. We don't want to take China's side. We want, don't want to take America's side, Europe or India. We will remain a neutral state. We will build our country because as a country that has been an independent country and we want to develop our ties. So very recently I saw that President Modi has made a statement about the 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment is something that happened in history as a result of the indo lanka Accord. This Accord has no relevance today to Sri Lanka. You, see, you, you must understand that the deployment of the Indian peacekeeping force, although we respect the Indians who lost their lives fighting the Tamil Tigers, 
this record has lost relevance and it happened long time ago it is no longer relevant it's like we talking about kashmir in 1947 48 what happened to what is happening in kashmir today you see it's a internal issue of india like the 13th amendment is an internal issue of sri lanka so i think that there's a election that is coming up in tamil nadu that may be the reason uh, mr modi has raised this issue but i think that it is very important for our indian colleagues to understand that we have to focus on the positive dimensions of our relationship you see because if we go back to the negative dimensions i think that we our can both our countries will not thrive this region will be a zone not of peace it will be a zone of disarmament so it is paramount for india to realize that there are three power centers here one is sri lanka colombo other is tamil nadu chennai other is delhi because we have seen some of the tamil sri lanka tamil separatist groups are putting pressure on the tamil nadu politicians and those politicians are exercising constituency and electoral pressures on new delhi new delhi will not accept it but i have to tell you the truth nedumara seema gopalasami vaiko uh, gopalasami many of these elements separatist elements are still using tamil nadu to promote the, the to sing the prabhakaran siren you see so and we have noticed there are some att elements still operating in tamil nadu so it is very important to make sure that there is very good security and intelligence cooperation we are india will not be used by these elements similarly sri lanka should guarantee that the islamist groups especially the groups based in pakistan in afghanistan or in the middle east these groups do not use sri lanka to to attack india or to build networks in sri lanka that will harm india so what i would say is that without playing politics it is very important for all our countries to work together because we are seeing that that this region entire region is entering a new phase of threat of islamic terrorism the islamic state has created assam and there is a significant threat that india is facing today if you look at the top 10 countries in the world that are suffer from terrorism india is one such country so it is very important for sri lanka and india to maintain a very close friendship and if we do not maintain a close relationship there will be no peace in this region let me make a few concluding remarks india did not participate in the commonwealth in the chogam meeting in 2013 over human rights issues but i want to share with you that human rights issues are being used as a political issue by the americans and by the europeans and it is very important for india not to do so you see all countries that are fighting terrorism has there are human rights violations what is important is when there is a violation those violations are investigated and they are addressed in sri lanka immediately when the war ended there were three phases one is a humanitarian phase where 11500 tamil tigers were rehabilitated they were given amnesty and released back to society governments don't want to start investigation to arrest those people because they have gone back to their families so human rights issue is not a real issue because 11500 tamil tigers who participated in killings maimings and injuring people killing leaders they are now back in our community you see so it is very important for india to understand that this issue has been resolved and it is a issue that is a irritant and should not be raised by india as a political issue of course there are atrocities other atrocities they should be addressed but it should not be turned into a political weapon let me also share with you that sri lanka has opened its doors for indian investment in fact many of the investment sri lanka gave to the chinese was first offered to india the president told me this personally 
and i think that it is very important for india to make use of this opportunity to very rapidly move and invest in sri lanka indians have been slow in taking those opportunities sri lanka has no preference of giving a land for opportunities for development to the chinese first it would always offer india first but india also should be ready to do that and i think that sri lanka and india can build a very beautiful relationship very much like the relationship we had in the distant past right and that we can forget the relationship that not forget maybe not be driven by those imperatives of 83 to 87 because that is a very um, it's a it's a it's a relationship that will not help for us even to recall that what happened during that period and we should look for new opportunities and new vistas especially under the regime of president gotabaya rajapaksa i thank you very much thank you professor kunwatna i think um, there there's a lot of interesting points that you brought up which i'd like to get into again um but let's let's hear a few views from uh, indian academia um and specifically from new delhi um dr malampati would you like to uh, make a few comments Uh, yes uh, thank you uh, first of all i would like to uh, thank uh, takshashila institution for uh, giving me this opportunity be, to be part of this uh, discussion on india sri lanka relations and the way forward and uh, very much uh, and also the two presentations which were uh, very uh, thoughtful presentations regarding india sri lanka relations in contemporary times uh, i would like to make a uh, few observations uh one is that uh, from the sri lankan uh, perspective as professor uh, gunaratne has pointed out uh, that is a that tamil nadu factor is a major uh, factor which is still influencing sri lanka's policy i mean towards india and its uh, external relations uh despite the fact that india supported the sri lankan uh, government uh, uh, during the war against the ltt and uh, and after the human and also the human rights council uh what was expected of this support was i think uh, from the indian perspective was the political resolution of the ethnic issue within sri lanka and with maximum consensus between various stakeholders uh i think but uh, sri lanka is to achieve that political consensus needed on the issue and the way forward uh, seems to be very complex uh and also as mentioned by professor gopatna india's emphasis on implementation of the 13th uh, amendment to the constitution of sri lanka as a way forward i mean for achieving peace and reconciliation uh i think uh, is not resonating with expectations of various stakeholders of peace process in sri lanka i mean that is also visible uh, in recent uh, years and months and uh, uh and in so in recent years political issues have taken a back seat in bilateral relations uh, but as pointed out by the panelist uh, it will continue to be maybe you know uh, to be an important factor in determining future relations between the two countries uh, uh it is uh, also that uh, the fact is that both the countries also uh, try to move forward and uh, you know try to in, in recent years uh, but not to dwell too much into the past and they both the countries have tried to move forward uh i believe uh, uh, i believe that uh, uh, it will also depend on even to move forward on political relations it depend on mostly on how sri lanka and india respond to uh, domestic and bilateral political issues in the future uh, because economic and security aspect of cooperation between the two countries is uh, um, i think is uh, very much intertwined with political issues uh, which are dominant for now and uh, maybe uh, may come up in the future uh, both sri lanka and uh, india have responded to, and continue to respond to the global uh, shifts uh, geopolitical challenges in the indian ocean region uh, keeping in view of their uh, respective uh, national interests uh, therefore security and economic aspect of cooperation are uh, dominated the bilateral relations in recent years uh as mentioned by the uh, uh, other uh, the panelist also the esteemed panelist that the three pillars of uh, according to the his excellency president gotabaya's uh, uh, gotabaya rajapaksha's uh, policy is that as mentioned in various statements also are the one is a national security economic development and foreign policy are the main three pillars uh, uh for sri lanka's uh, uh, to develop sri lanka but sri lanka will uh, follow an india first policy at uh, strategic and security level 
uh, there seems to be convergence of interest in this regard in recent years. Uh, one example has been Cooperation India extended uh, after the Eastern Sunday attack uh, in Sri Lanka in 2019. However, uh, uh, India has been a constant factor in shaping uh, Sri Lanka's external relations as well as domestic policies. While insisting on neutral and Asia-centric foreign policy, uh, uh, Sri Lanka also tried to leverage its geostrategic location in the IOR, rightly so from Sri Lankan perspective. Uh, Sri Lanka's uh, uh, engagement uh, with China in post years is one such example. And uh, despite the concerns regarding the payment, repayment, uh, Sri Lanka and China continue to work within the framework of strategic uh, cooperative partnership agreement uh, that was signed uh, in 2014. Uh, uh, not just with China, Sri Lanka's uh, engagement with uh, US in political and security sphere has increased in recent years. Uh, one example has been the US-Sri uh, Lanka partnership dialogue that was signed in 2016, covering a wide range of areas, including maritime cooperation, counterterrorism, uh, cooperation towards uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. So basically, Sri Lanka tried to engage with the two powers, seemingly balancing its relations and endorsing both the ideas of free and open Indo-Pacific, as well as the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, for India, given the uh, current uh, uh, differences with China and the new directions in India-Sri Lanka relations, I think it will expect Sri Lanka to understand uh, India's security concerns and uh, work towards stable and secure uh, Indian Ocean region. I think this aspect needs a constant engagement at the bilateral level and, at, and uh, also addressing each other's concerns in a uh, in transparent manner. Uh, at present, there are various sort of apprehensions regarding increasing presence of extra-regional powers in the region. Uh, another point I would like to make is that uh, in terms of maritime cooperation or the, uh, the cooperation for uh, peace and security in the Ocean region, and India's uh, vision for Sagar and Sri Lanka's quest to emerge uh, as an important commercial hub in the Indian Ocean region by engaging and uh, cooperating with extra region powers are also seems to be not in uh, sync. As far as uh, economic cooperation is concerned, uh, Sri Lanka is facing a dual challenge of post-war recovery and COVID-19 impact on the economy. But uh, India's economic engagement with Sri Lanka is not well appreciated going to, I think, the mainly the trust deficit, uh, though it is a very multifaceted relationship as mentioned by uh, uh, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Ingrajit uh, Kumaraswamy, uh, uh, the economic projects that were agreed upon is still to be implemented. And there is no guarantee that those will be implemented in the future. Uh, and there are a lot of opposition to economic investments by India within Sri Lanka also from various political parties. Uh, so I don't know whether, for instance, uh, um, uh, because, because it is clear that Sri Lanka is looking towards other countries in the region and beyond for enhancing economic cooperation. But I think when it comes to the uh, security cooperation, uh, Sri Lanka has been giving NGI priority. So Sri Lanka's government's emphasis on uh, joint ventures, foreign direct investment, and uh, built operate transfer model to develop economy, whether it will include India in the future, uh, is uh, is something to you know uh, discuss. And what measures or uh, India can take or Sri Lanka can take to initiatives to improve trust and uh, and work on joint projects uh, for the benefit of both the countries and the region is the question uh, to ponder. And, uh, and lastly, I would like to just uh, ask a few uh, questions. Uh, one is that how Sri Lanka perceives uh, India's increasing engagement with the US and implications for the region? Uh, uh, and, uh, and Professor Gunaratna, if you can answer, like, do you think the countries are, both Sri Lanka and India, are in sync with the current geopolitical challenges in the region? And uh, if not, why? And, uh, and also has India's neighborhood uh, first policy and uh, Sri Lanka's insistence on Asia-centric policy uh, really helped in bridging the trust deficit between the two countries? And uh, what measures that uh, the country should take uh, to bridge the gap? I think these are the few questions I have for the panelists. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Malimpati. Um, uh, panelists, would you like to take those questions before we move on? I would like to say that uh, the question that was posed with regard to um, how India's engagement with the United States is viewed, I think that Sri Lankans are watching very carefully, very closely 
this particular engagement. Because for a considerable period of time, the US was very close to Sri Lanka. And US had no relationship with India until 1990, their relationship was bad. Sri Lanka had the VOA, had uh, many American uh, investments, projects, American military training programs. This is all viewed negatively. But after 1990, we have seen that India-US relationship has enhanced. But more recently, we have seen the Quad, the Japanese, the Australians coming together with the US and India. So if all these countries become very active in the Indian Ocean region, will become active in the Indo-Pacific region, especially to contain China, will there be peace in our region? So this is one of the questions that are being asked. I think that there will be tremendous interest, especially when extra regional actors operate in the Indian Ocean region. Thank you. May I just respond to a couple of things? Please, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samatha. Um, let me just say, I, I think this trust issue that you raise is, is very important. Uh, and as uh, Rohan said, we are family, we have our spats, um, but there are some lingering sensitivities, I think, which continue to, um, to persist. Um, and your very pertinent question, okay, Sri Lanka is pivoting from debt to equity, but will Indian investment be welcome? Now, I think um, there, uh, there are a number of Indian companies which are thriving in Sri Lanka, are doing very well. So I think I don't see any, you know, where there is an issue is when it's government to government relations, when strategic assets are involved. But for Indian companies to come and invest and do business in Sri Lanka, either as FDI or as joint ventures, um, then I, I, I don't foresee a major problem. But also I feel there are a couple of things which are low hanging fruit. One is on ETCA and for India to, to resolve some of the impediments that constrain the ISLFTA and progress has already been made and to crystallize that. And the second is, you know, there is a real selling point, which I, if, if I was in the Indian High Commission, I would talk about this every day. The National Ambulance Service was gifted to Sri Lanka by India on a grant basis. There was tremendous controversy when it was introduced. It is now appreciated by all Sri Lankans, but I don't know how many Sri Lankans know that it is a grant from, from India. You know, it, it is now highly appreciated. And this is something I think India should get its message across. This is something that India granted to Sri Lanka. And I can say on investment, for instance, we need to revive something which was started a few years back. I think it was about 2013. The CII brought a very, very high power business delegation headed by Adil Godridge, Bharti Mittal, Rahul Bajaj, you know, stellar names from the Indian private sector, about seven, eight of them came to Sri Lanka. And a task force was set up to take forward uh, the, the, the building um, uh, the conditions for Indian investment. And the chair on the Sri Lankan side Mr. Susanta Ratnaika is the current chair of the Board of Investment. At that time, he was chairman of the uh, of John Keels Holdings by market cap, the largest company in Sri Lanka. So then shortly after that, we had the sub submarine incident. And there was another family spat and things got uh, distracted. And now I think we need to pick up the threads there. A lot of work was done. And I think that when it was done in 2013, under the present government. And I think, and Susanta Ratnaika knows this better than anybody. He was, he, was, he was chair of the task force. So I think some of those threats need to be picked up. So I, I, areas were identified and there is scope for Indian investment. Even in Port City, uh, you know, uh, the Port City, the C Central Bank of Sri Lanka is adjacent to the Port City. In fact, from my office in the Central Bank, I could see the <laughs> reclamation day by day taking place. Um, um, and, and the head of Czech, the, the Chinese company developing it, has told me that they are very keen to get Indian investment into the port city because they feel that will bring about stability for their investment. 
So there is scope for Indian investment. As I said, in the new special economic zone, in big infrastructure projects like the LNG project and then the East terminal, et cetera. I know there are some issues, but hopefully they will get resolved. So they, they, I don't think there will be, we will need to work at it. But I think India should see, given that Sri Lanka is now turning to equity, India has an opportunity. Indian companies have an opportunity. Equally, I think Sri Lankan company, the companies will have, a, have an opportunity in India, particularly if the uh, manufacturing in India strategy takes off and the global uh, reconfiguration of supply chains, all that. There's a new, new normal uh, going forward, which should help uh, develop um, the bilateral economic relations. Thank you, Dr. Kumar Swami. Um, Dr. Mayal Vaganan, um, over to you, um, for your comments and any questions for our panelists. Thank you, Anirudh. And, uh... It's a pleasure to have part of this uh, discussion and thanks to the Takshila and Pathfinders uh, Institution uh, for giving the opportunity, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear uh, Dr. Kuruswami's, uh, Humar Swami and, uh, sorry, and uh, Professor Rogan Gunaratne's uh, talk today. Um, it has covered uh, the wide range of issues, um, uh, both economic as well as the um, uh, Professor Gunaratne's candid uh, take on the India-Sri Lanka relations. So I have few points in a way to summarize and to in the end to just put out a few questions or in a sense, uh, uh, some comments which they can think about it and answer later. Uh, on Dr. Kumar Swami's uh, the talk, essentially spoke about uh, uh, the India's neighborhood policy and how made in India can be a potential opportunity for Sri Lanka where they can be part of the regional value chain, supply chain. Uh, is well taken and um, I think uh, being a large, uh, largest country or the big country in the region, India needs to accommodate and give concession to the uh, small neighbors. And um, India, I think the policy makers in New Delhi are aware of this. And uh, they've been working uh, towards accommodating the, uh, the neighbors uh, request and their uh, desire. But uh, the problem is one point I think Professor, uh, the, the Dr. Uh, Indrajit Kumar Swami brought out is that even if you, you know, take up all what is produced in Sri Lanka, it is not going to dent India's economy or the supply chain. But the problem is each neighbor among the uh, neighborhood in the, in the region or in the external neighborhood wants the same thing. So how much you can take, where you need to stop it. Like you cannot uh, accommodate uh, in a request from all the neighbors from Sri Lanka to Myanmar or even from the extended. You need to somewhere have a, a, a limitation, a line. So that's where the problem for India. Even on the scholarship or any development activity, if India has given 2,000 scholarship, tomorrow there's a demand for 4,000. So when India is itself not trying to develop its own internal setup, infrastructure, monetization of uh, the health care system, education system, all, accommodating the request or the uh, you know, interest wishes from the neighbors, it's becoming difficult. Though we like to do it, we have a, 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 a difficulty in uh, taking it all at a time. So uh, case by case, and then in a certain way, uh, the, I think it's been uh, uh, you know, formulated, the policies are formulated by the central government in India to accommodate, but it's well taken. Uh, on the fishery, which he touched upon, uh, I completely understand when, after, when the Sri Lanka came out of the war in 2009, the Sri Lankan fishermen are venturing into the sea to have their own livelihood. It's completely understand. And I think the state Indian government also understands this, that there is a need for the Sri Lankan fishermen to fish in their water. And when the water has been clearly demarcated in 1974, it was accepted, the Kachatiu is all. But one thing which, you know, uh, which I think makes the issue more sensitive and brings to the uh, limelight is the uh, killing or shooting of the Indian fishermen. If they simply arrest the Indian fisherman who is crossing the line and make whatever law according to Sri Lankan law put in the prison, doesn't have any much impact. Only when the killing happens, the shooting happens, it became a sensitive issue where it forces the government in state level, either Tamil Nadu or the Indian government to intervene or come down. So I think that uh, the Sri Lankan government also needs to understand that they can legally, they can, you know, uh, do whatever is necessary if they want to stop the Indian uh, fishermen venturing into it. Only the killing uh, extrajudicial activities are, can be stopped. But of course, the Sri Lankans have been saying that we have tried, it's not working, so we have to go to the next level. I think even uh, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, when he's in the power, he said same thing. 
but uh, but the given the other side of the india the sensitivity nature nature involves in the shooting killing i think um, the one thing i think the sri lankan government should uh, think about this in having a humanitarian most of the time it happens in some issue cases only the shooting has been reported but these are the things i think a sensitive which i think can rock the india sri lanka relation and uh, finally i think uh, dr kumar sami also have said that uh, um since sri lanka is also towards the uh, the progress towards the development uh, utilizing the capital from china is essential is well taken as a sovereign country any country can go with any country in utilizing the the uh, what is strategic location or uh, the free friendship which they have for their own strategic purpose and uh, national interest well taken but um, when they when there is much more than the economic uh, commercial interest when we see a political or security a strategic alignment which may not be uh, visible uh, above the surface but definitely there are certain thing can be understood by the academician as well as by the policy maker when that happens i think there the china prism comes into the india sri lanka relationship so the question is even on the mathala airport when the proposal for india to take over when the uh, i think indian government had a discussion with the sri lankan government i think the proposal was presented even on the port and uh, the colombo port and other there was a discussion during the last regime uh, later on the mathala and other play the project proposals of india was said it's not in a good manner or positive manner the reason is the chinese uh, the sri lankan's expectation is something like on china in terms of offering india cannot yeah. offer india cannot offer that much because india has a limitation because it's developing its own internal uh, the infrastructure as well as to take care of the all the neighbors so where we cannot match china immediately the sri lankans and sri lankan government says that this is a, like a peanut which we cannot satisfy and we need to go to china we obviously understand because a sovereign country you can go but when it is more than commercial it became a problem so that's the point i want so i want to have his view how what is the best possible mechanism you think that uh, that india and the sri lanka can deal with it without uh, rocking the relationship by having the china prism on uh, professor rohan gunaratne's uh, the talk i have heard about i uh, have heard his talk earlier and uh, uh, um, read his uh, articles and uh, some of the books are well known and today's talk also very candid he said that starting from the invasion he has brought a sound in our 18 invasion from india and he also said india trained uh, the sri lankan tamils in 70s and 80s i think this is the narration which we all know but why do india needs to do it see for example invasion of india like 17 or 18 times in the ancient time and middle east uh, mid, uh, the what, sorry the middle uh, the medieval time you cannot still have that to say today's the relationship uh, because of that there is a uh, what you call fear or because of that there is a possibility of india if you see that we india has witnessed uh, the invasion from uh, the persia from afghanistan even from the uh, mongolia so but we never from sri lanka actually the, uh, during the i think during the padawa period there were a couple of sri lankan invasions <laughs> of tamil nadu british have ruled india for more than uh, of 100 years we should not have that in mind in having the relationship i think given the uh, this this i think uh, the uh, the fear of uh, the india seeing from the invasion early invasion or only from the tamils perspective of the tamils prism i think this is the most prevalent in this single east society in sri lanka i think this needs to be changed first right what happened in history is happened the kingdoms are usually used to fight to invade have an invasion and conquest to expand their territory even the cholas went up to javas but today the indonesian people are not saying india as something else or we are not saying i think the historical context should be forgot and we should move forward that's the first point second one he also brought out that there is a element in tamil nadu like nedumaran seeman gopalasamy and there is this elements can what do you call um, uh, make a dent in india sri lanka relation there need to be security and intelligent level uh, mechanism but i want to tell to professor rohan gunaratne i also worked on this issues tamil nadu issues and india sri lanka the names you have suggested they will not even gather 100 votes in tamil nadu even there's a election tomorrow and for your kind information nedumaran seeman and gopal sami have not won election in, in tamil nadu only basis of sri lanka the sri lanka is became a topic is like a tea shop uh, you know discussion or gossip for tamilian because of the given proximity but it doesn't turn into a political issue or doesn't make the candidate to win only on the sri lankan issue why sri lankan issue became important for tamil nadu or tamilian to speak is when there was a refugees 
coming to the shows in Bay of Bengal, getting into the Tamil Nadu, the, the media highlighted the, the stories of the refugees who are coming to it. The inflow of refugees has made the issue uh, and the, as a, uh, the electoral representative, they need to talk about it, even they know that it is from the other country, right? And each country, whether it is not only India, on the uh, Malayalis from Kerala who are in uh, Gulf region, the, the Kerala government used to talk about it. Malayalis are used to talk about it. If something happens in uh, the uh, Bangladesh, the Bengalis in West Bengal are talking about it. These all because India's given size and the unity in diversity, there may be minor level or these smaller level of state level policies or discussion which can happen narratives. And this is not impacting the central government always. But being a coalition partner, sometimes their policies are taken consider uh, by the central government on based uh, case by cases. And also please remember that India doesn't want to really involve. You forget about, and most of the time we also forget about, India also supports Sri Lankan government on the JVP. JVPs are who? They're not the Tamilians, minorities. It's against English. When there's a leftist insurgency happening, India supported it. India supported it in other cases also. One, but the thing is, if you say see the Sri Lanka, culturally, ethnically, civilization wise, all, all have Indian connection, whether it's a, this a Sinhalese or Tamils or Muslims. You are talking only from the Sri Lankan Tamil. We also have upcountry Tamil, yeah, Indian, the but, Tamil. But Kamal, I'm, I'm sorry, we have only 10 minutes left, so I'm going yeah, to I'm have just, to ask you to. The last point, right. Yeah. India never intervened even in, uh, when the citizenship was you know, removed for them, they become uh, the stateless. We have only negotiation with them, we never sided. It is because of the local issue in Sri Lanka, when you are not able to resolve with the minorities within your country, it becomes an issue where India needs to have some human humanitarian concern. That's it. And um, uh, finally, I want to uh, tell to, you know, just want to uh, bring to his uh, attention to seek his answer. Given this historical baggage, whatever you have highlighted, we well understood. But where you think that India and Sri Lanka can move forward without having to look backward instead of only looking forward. Where do you think there's a scope for India and Sri Lanka? Thank you very much. Panelists? Shall I quickly, shall I quickly answer, Rohan, and then you, you take the more the much tougher things. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, you know, on the, on all countries also will obviously lay a claim to the Indian market. I understand that. Uh, but essentially, what we are saying is that uh, I personally believe that some liberalization of the Indian economy will benefit India also. And then it will be competition. You know, you, you can have a level playing field between the other countries and Sri Lanka. And we'll compete. What we are asking is really for some of the uh, non-tariff barriers. You know, after all, you know, intra-regional trade is lowest in South Asia. I mean, we are way behind everybody. Uh, so in increasing inter-regional trade can boost growth in all the countries in the region. And India is the largest market. And so in some areas, we're saying, okay, you if it's a level playing field, liberalize, and Sri Lanka will compete. So we are not asking for more than Bangladesh or Nepal or anybody else, but uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, liberalized, uh, some liberalization of the Indian market, which I think will benefit India as well as its uh, neighbors. Fisheries, to the uh, Rohan will connect me if I'm wrong, to the best of my knowledge, that is no longer a policy. I don't think the Sri Lankan authorities will be shooting Indian fishermen uh, going forward. Um, as far as I understand this issue, and I'm not very knowledgeable, is that the problem is the nexus between the fishermen and political elements in Tamil Nadu. That, that, that is the problem. That is what is the biggest constraint. And at the time when in a coalition government, the Tamil Nadu government had a considerable weight at, in Delhi, um, that, that was a problem. But now that that is no longer an issue, hopefully it is now easier to resolve some of these issues. And I hope they'll be, they'll be taken up. On, on, on China, the Chinese relationship going beyond commercial, you know, I, if you look at some of the narrative that has arisen, uh, as Professor pointed out very pertinently, both for Hamantota, for Hamantota, it was first offered to India then offered to Japan. Only when both of those countries didn't accept was it given to China. The uh, China International Container Terminal in Colombo Harbor. Again, it was an open uh, competition. It was put out to tender and India didn't bid. 
So, you know, so it was not going beyond normal commercial relationships to allow China in, in, into these things. Um, uh, and and the, the other narrative, of course, is, is that Sri Lanka is the poster child of the Chinese debt trap. Well, Chinese, uh, Sri Lanka's debt to China is about 13% or 14% of its total debt. In fact, Sri Lanka's debt to Japan is greater than Sri Lanka's debt to China. Of course, the Chinese debt has been growing yeah, uh, faster in recent years than any other debt. But the main debt is to the multilaterals and Japan is then, there's uh, below them and then uh, China after that. And now the government has said, we do not want any more debt. We want equity. We are going to pivot from debt to equity. So they've recognized that. So uh, you know, us getting more and more into a China debt trap is no longer on the agenda. And even that string of pearls thesis doesn't hold all the water if, uh, if China was only the third choice for the Hamman Um Then uh, on, um, you know, having a kind of a trust uh, across the two countries, uh, I think, um, and a mechanism, I think you specifically uh, asked about, uh, Rohan, again, will know much more about this. You know, there was a trika created at the end of the, uh, the, the civil conflict, uh, and um, um, which comprised at that time President uh, President Gotabe as Defense Secretary, uh, uh, Dalit Piratunga, who's a uh, pre President's special advisor now, who was then Secretary of the pre President Mahinda Rajapaksa, and Mr. Basil Rajapaksa. If you can, if we can create a high-level uh, troika or similar mechanism, which has constant dialogue then some of these issues that come up. For instance, the, the, the CIA visit getting distracted by the submarine visits or some of the other issues on the strategic side so that we can have a, at a very high level, consistent dialogue, both countries speaking to each other. I think President Rajapaksa himself, President Gotabe Rajapaksa himself, I think probably is taking this bilateral relationship very much under his wing. And he has appointed as High Commissioner to, to Delhi, an extremely able person who, who he, uh, who he uh, trusts. And for, I, there should be full disclosure, that person, Milinda Morogoda, is the founder of the Pathfinder Foundation. So, uh, but I think, so he is gonna take a personal interest and I think we should create some kind of mechanism as, it was, as there was at the end of the war, which cl clarified a lot of things and which facilitated cooperation between the two countries. So I think the restoration of some, that kind of mechanism might well be helpful. I hope I've picked up all the lessons that uh, Dr. Mailwagalam raised, and thank you very much for doing that. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm afraid we only have three minutes now, so I'd like to take one question, at least from the audience. Um, Mr. Hebdiker, over to you. I uh, <clears throat> precisely have no questions to ask, but there are a few points <clears throat> I would like to bring to the table. <clears throat> the first is the, one of the um, uh, ideas behind this webinar was to create a kind of trust, a kind of understanding between think tanks and try and expand its, um, it to other areas of you know, um, uh, relationship between the, both the countries. Um, when I take back a lot of lessons uh, where I was in Sri Lanka during a very difficult period in their time, and I saw uh, the present relation, the, the present uh, dispensation when Mr. Rajapaksa, Mahindra Rajapaksa was the leader of the opposition, he became the prime minister, he became the president, I interacted with both his brothers. And I think I, there is a certain sense of understanding what they are planning to do and what is required to be done. Last year, we had a webinar, a seminar at the ICWA, where the title was, Do We Need to Move Away from the Shadows of the 80s? There was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, unhappiness over the way things had progressed. I said, yes, there is a need for more sunshine in the relationship, and we should take it forward. There are three elements that I need to you know, focus. One is that there is a need for greater understanding of uh, different issues between both the countries. Apart from how do you look at diplomatic relations, diplomatic relations, the political relations, trade, commerce, and economy, strategy, and cultural. 
all this thing cannot be done by the government itself when i was in sri lanka i requested the then high commissioner nirupam sen to set up what was called the indo sri lanka parliamentary friendship association we require parliamentarians of both sides to meet often on a common platform we have this platform in the union parliament of india we have 17 such associations and i think this is one of the biggest boons we have the second one is how to create a feeling that yes investments are to a street there are a large number of indian investors who are willing to get to sri lanka today i have had discussions up to today to about 40 to 50 million dollars which people want to take into this country and yes when uh, the situation stabilizes with the new high commissioner in uh, in delhi and with the new the new high commissioner in uh, colombo i think we will be able to build a bridge to it yes i think we need to understand that time has come to create uh, better forms of trust between both sides the biggest thing like professor rohan and i discuss that we need also to need to reach out to the uh, to the uh, the four manaikas who are very important in sri lankan way of life we cannot forget this that yes like 79 to 80% buddhist country where the clergy plays an important role we have two countries in our neighborhood where the clergy plays a major role myanmar and sri lanka we need to look at how can we bridge this gap between the clergy of both sides i'm not only talking about the buddhist clergy there are a number of other institutions in india that we need to come together that we have to build trust for example when mahindra rajapaksha was the president he started the trilateral the trilingual commission popularizing tamil uh, singhalese and english why she thought taking i think these are some of the areas where we can build trust among ourselves so there are many more things that can be done but yes i think i personally believe what dr miles said about the uh, fisheries issue uh, in a week fortnight's time there is going to be a webinar organized in chennai i would like to invite the pathfinder foundation and uh, uh, dr miles and others to join us we'll have a look at what are the issues and how do we take it forward from there last but not the least i think this should not be the only uh, interaction between uh, the path by the foundation and the takshila maybe there are many more interactions that are necessary i think the more we talk the better we be, begin to understand each other i think i have a very good equation with dr rohan uh, professor rohan i have i don't want to shy away from it we have understood each other to the extent understand i read his books i knew where he comes from what he exactly is he say but yes i am willing to take it on board as long as you know we begin to move forward like what my other colleagues on the panel have said i think with these few words uh, i must thank uh, soyash and uh, pranay for agreeing to hold this and to anil for having you know uh, compared this and uh, i think i'll keep in touch with rohan and also with uh, dr kumar swami thank you very much for the opportunity thank you sir uh, with that we are out of time uh, i'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, very warmly for the interesting points you've raised uh, like i i feel uh, that i've learned a lot more about the complexities of this relationship over the course of the last uh, one hour and 45 minutes um and also thank you so much to all of our audience i'm so sorry we haven't been able to uh, take your questions uh, but please keep in touch with us there's going to be a lot more deep webinars like this uh, about india and its neighborhood um and thank you all once again for spending your friday Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.